Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to OFC in Exile. Now, after a break of four weeks, we're back in Paul's letter to Titus. So I'm going to read now the first nine verses of chapter one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised from the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, Grace and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus is not our man in Havana, he is God's man on Crete. Where the Acts of the Apostle ends with Paul the Apostle under house arrest in Rome for two years, the pastor epistles 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus give us an insight into Paul's later ministry. He sailed to Crete with his associate in the gospel, Titus. It seems the islanders have responded to the word of God. Churches have been established all over the island. But Paul has now sailed on and has left Titus on the island for him to put in order what was left unfinished. That's how verse 5 puts it. The Greek verb translated as set in order consists of three parts. One of the parts is the word ortho, derived from orthos, from which we get the word orthodontist in English. What is an orthodontist? Well, they're dental specialists who straighten out and align crooked teeth. That is why some Bible versions portray Titus's task in verse 5 as to straighten out what was left unfinished. What needed urgently straightening out on Crete? The lack of elders. The churches needed leadership. Just like an aeroplane is incomplete without wings, a car is incomplete without tires, a bike is incomplete without pedals, a church is incomplete without elders. And in verses six to nine, Paul then sets out the qualifications for eldership. He gives Titus precise instructions on the kind of leaders the local church needs. The elders Titus was to appoint had to meet Paul's strict criteria in the home, in personal character, and in doctrine. How they conducted themselves as husbands and fathers, how they conducted themselves in everyday life in the church and in the local community, and what they believed were critical to their eligibility to serve as elders. What kind of leaders does a local church need? It's a huge subject. So much can be said. It's a very important subject. The right leadership is critical to the health of the local church. The quality of a church is very often reflected in its caliber of leadership. So it would be beneficial to spend a few weeks in these verses to understand what Paul was saying to Titus and how it applies to us today in our context. This morning, we will limit ourselves to the general qualifications for eldership and see how any potential leader should behave in the home. Let's look first at some basic points Paul makes about eldership. There should be, ideally, firstly, 
multiple elders. The New Testament model for eldership was plural and not singular. Titus should appoint elders in every town. Paul didn't tell Titus to appoint a pastor, a church minister or an overseer. He told him to appoint elders. Leadership in the church in every town on Crete was to be collective. Leadership was to be shared. In 1973, a phenomenally successful record was released, Tubular Bells. It sounded as if there were a whole array of musicians playing many kinds of different instruments who were responsible for the sound. In fact, there was just one, Mike Oldfield. He played them all. He was literally a one-man band. He played one instrument, then another, and then another, and each recording was overlaid onto the master recording that became Tubular Bells. When it comes to leadership in the local church, there can be no Mike Oldfield model. There can be no one-man band. There can be no just one elder. Leadership is pulled. Eldership is shared. It is surprising that it is only relatively recently that many conservative evangelical churches have caught on to this. In the past, churches have called a pastor. He became the elder. He was assisted by a, a number of deacons, but as the elder, he had the decisive word. It left a very real danger. He could become an autocrat. So-called strong leadership was in fact a benign or sometimes not so benign dictatorship. More serious still, with this model of leadership, the, the pastor or elder had no other leaders to whom he was accountable. His decisions were not sufficiently scrutinized. His personal behavior was not held to account. The pastor may have been a godly man, but even the godliest of people need checks and balances. This was not the way of the New Testament church. Eldership was plural. Perhaps one other thing should be mentioned. Eldership may be plural in a particular church, but it must also be authentic. Eldership must not be in name only. The elders must not be paying mere lip service to the principle of shared leadership. In theory, the church is being led by its elders, but in practice, the other elders are mere yes men to just one of their number. The pastor or the dominant elder proposes something and the others immediately fall into line. No shared leadership has to be genuine and not cosmetic. Secondly, they were male elders. There is no reference in the New Testament to women elders in the local church. The elders Paul told Titus to appoint were men. There were, of course, men in the New Testament whose in the New Testament church whose labor in the Lord was exemplary and whose contribution to church life was immense. To the church in Philippi, Paul singles out Euodia and Syntyche, whom he commends as having commended his side in the cause of Christ. At the end of his letter to Romans, he sends Paul sends two greetings to two women, Tryphena and Tryphosa, whom he describes as having worked very hard in the Lord. Paul commends Phoebe to the church at Rome and notes how she had been not only a great help to him personally, but to many other people as well. Paul valued women's ministry, but as an apostle of Christ, he reserved the role of elder for men. Churches affiliated to the FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, work on this basis. Eldership is the preserve of men. But if elders are sensible, they listen to the women in the church with spiritual insight, or perhaps with professional skills, the elders simply don't have. These women have an expertise the men, the elders, don't possess. We've been thinking about blessed are the meek on the last two Wednesdays. An important component of meekness is teachability. It's the willingness to be corrected when you are wrong and the readiness to be informed when you're ignorant of something. Elders are not to be macho but meek, eager to learn from all corners of the church. The young, the elderly, 
and the godly and spiritually mature ladies in the church. But the buck should stop with the male leadership of the local church. Most of the mainline Protestant denominations have departed from this New Testament principle in recent years. The United Reformed Churches, Methodist Churches, Baptist Union affiliated churches, and many, but not all, Church of England churches. It is a hard thing to say and will horrify many Christians, but there does seem to be a link with compromise on this issue and further down the line, far more radical compromises with fundamental Christian doctrine. For instance, the United Reformed Church was the first mainstream denomination to ordain a woman minister as far back as 1917. Nearly a hundred years later, 2016, it was also the first mainstream denomination to allow same-sex marriages in church. In 1974, women were first ordained as elders or presbyters in Methodist churches. Next month, the Methodist Conference votes on the recommendation to change its doctrine of marriage and also to allow same-sex marriages in Methodist churches. I imagine a Methodist Christian in 1974 would have thought it inconceivable that 47 years later, Methodism would be standing on the cusp, on the brink of permitting two people of the same sex to marry in church. But when one Christian belief, traditional belief is challenged and changed in the church, it stands to reason that it won't be long before another one is. So elders are to be multiple, they're to be male, but they're also to be blameless. Look at verse six. This is a crucially important qualification for eldership, so much so that Paul uses the same Greek word and then can let us again in verse seven. What does blameless mean? Well, it cannot mean to be perfect. In Spurgeon's famous words, I met only one perfect man once and he was a perfect nuisance. There are no perfect candidates for eldership. Blamelessness cannot mean perfection, otherwise no one would be eligible. My Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament Greek words makes this explanation of anenkenos. It imp and this is what it says. It implies not merely acquittal, but the absence of even a charge or an accusation against a person. In other words, not only does mud not stick to the potential elder, there is no mud to throw at him. So perhaps another way of defining blameless is to render it above reproach. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase of the New Testament, puts it like this. Elders are to be men of unquestioned integrity. So these are Paul's opening thoughts about eldership. They should be multiple, male, and the men should be blameless beyond reproach. But then he turns his attention to a potential elder's home life. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Where is the evidence of a man's suitability to be an elder? Well, first of all, it is in the home. Does this exclude men who are not married or who have no children from eldership? No, I don't think so. Some of the most effective Christian leaders of the 20th century have been bachelors. Think of Dick Lucas at St. Helen's Bishopgate or John Stott at All Souls Langham Place in the heart of London. Think of Paul himself, he wasn't married. With all Titus's traveling commitments in gospel ministry, it is likely that he too wasn't married. But Paul is making the assumption that the vast majority of the men to be considered for eldership in the local church will be married. And in that case, the potential elder is to have a strong marriage and to be a devoted family man. Why is this so important? Well, if a man has made a reasonable job of his family life, it provides solid evidence that he may be capable of doing a good job for the Lord's people in the local church. The way a man leads his own family will be indicative of the way he would lead God's family. 
Paul draws a, a very clear parallel between the family and the church family. As he writes to Timothy in his first letter, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how will he take care of God's church? Therefore, if a man has been a tyrant at home, he will be a, a tyrant in leadership at the local church. If he doesn't take responsibility at home, you can be sure he won't take responsibility at church. If he is neglectful of what needs to be done in the home, he will be neglectful of what needs to be done in the church. His fitness to lead is indicated by his home life. And what is the basic assumption about his family life? Well, firstly, he should be faithful to his wife. If he is blameless, then he is loyal to his life's companion. The literal translation of the Greek is, he must be a one woman man. One commentator puts it very well. The man who has a faithful heart for his wife will be the kind of man who has a faithful heart for the local church. He doesn't flirt with other women. He doesn't chase after other women. He doesn't commit virtual adultery by accessing internet pornography. He cares for and cherishes his wife. As the marriage vows state, he has forsaken all others for her. There have been over the years many gifted men who have fallen in this regard. There have been some high profile cases of men who have stumbled morally and others whose descent into sexual immorality has only come to light at a local level. In the grace of God, some have come to their senses, have repented and have sought the forgiveness of their wives and family. The argument is made by some well-meaning Christians. Well, these men should be given the license to resume their ministries. If they had been serving as a pastor, perhaps they should move on to another church and start over. To lose their gifts of preaching and public ministry would be a terrible loss to the church. It would be a criminal waste. They should be given a second chance. They've been effective before in God's service. They can be effective again. Therefore, they should be allowed back into a position of leadership. They should be allowed back into the pulpit. But the New Testament makes it clear. There can be no way back into leadership or eldership. Elders must be blameless, above reproach. They must be the kind of men to whom no mud can stick. And in this regard, such men have failed. They must be one woman men. But they haven't lived up to this. They are thus disqualified from eldership. It has to be this way. The sanction has to be this severe. The purity of the bride of Christ is at stake. The church's credibility in the eyes of the outside world is also at stake. Surely it cannot be credible for a pastor preaching biblical ethics to be exposed as an adulterer, only for him to crop up in another pulpit elsewhere preaching the same message. It would reek of hypocrisy, it would stink. For those who argue that the penalty of banishment from Christian leadership is too harsh, I would say, why should the punishment be any less severe than that of the society we live in? If a policeman is caught drink driving, he's sacked, his career is over. Just this last week, an MP who had been found guilty of the sexual harassment of a parliamentary aide lost the party whip and is under great pressure from his own party to stand down from the House of Commons. The principle is clear. Law enforcers and lawmakers cannot be lawbreakers. If these are the standards of the world, surely the standards of Christ Church should be even higher. So for the prospective or serving elder to fall into adultery, it can never make him above reproach or blameless. He cannot be considered for eldership or he would have to resign if already in office. Proverbs 6 verse 32 says this telling me, but a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. If an elder, pastor or church leader stumbles in this way and genuinely repents, there is forgiveness 
God's grace is great. As the hymn puts it, oh, how the grace of God amazes me. It loosed me from my bonds and set me free. It is amazing grace. There is cleansing through Christ's blood. There will be further opportunities to be useful in Christian service. Usefulness is not excluded. Service is not prohibited. But leadership in Christ church is. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife. But there is more. An elder must be a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. All Christian parents of teenagers take a sharp intake of breath at these words. These words have caused many a sincere Christian leader to consider his position. How can he possibly serve as an elder in the church? Sunday morning is a nightmare for him and his wife. Their 14 year old son is rebelling against having to go to church. He loves football and the team he trains with plays its matches on a Sunday at 10.30, just when the morning church service begins. The 12 year old daughter is also giving them a hard time. She couldn't go to the sleepover at a friend's house on Saturday night because she would miss the Sunday morning service. She's in a sulk. Why can't we just be like a normal family? She screams at her parents. In our post-Christian society, these are the very real issues Christian families face. Furthermore, what children are being taught in many schools with the proliferation of the LBGT agenda is making the youngsters from Christian homes question what they hear in church about biblical morality. Is church teaching me to be a bigot? Church is way out of step with modern day values. Understandably, they're confused. What they hear at home and in church is so out of kilter with what they hear at school and on the media. A few months ago, I went back to Hayes Lane Baptist Church to take the morning service there. I heard about a teenage girl who was attending one of the most sought after schools in Bromley, but she was in great distress. This school had adopted a very strong diversity agenda. She was juggling two messages in her mind, one from home and church on the one hand and from school on the other. It was doing her head in. Whom should she listen to? It's against this background. We read these words about the qualification for eldership. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. The second half of Paul's statement, we understand. If a father has to go regularly to the police station on a Saturday night because their son has gotten into trouble, if he has to go with his wife regularly to his school's, his daughter's school because she is truanting, and when she is actually at school, he's very disruptive in class, we get there is a problem. He might well not be living up to the expectation that he is managing his household well, and therefore he is not suitable material for eldership. But an elder or prospective elder cannot force his children to believe, especially in the post-Christian world of today. Surely Paul has set the bar too high. Paul isn't living in today's world. This is an unattainable qualification for eldership. What would be the case, for instance, if a man and his wife have multiple children, six for instance, five are believers and one is a prodigal? Would this disqualify him from eldership? These are difficult issues. How do we interpret Paul's words in the second half of verse six? How can we apply them today? I looked to the commentators for help. There was a wide range of opinion, opinion among them about how this verse applies. A good number, it has to be said, had a quite a strict interpretation. One put it like this. If a man cannot bring his own children to salvation and to godly living, he will not have the confidence of the church in his ability to lead other unbelievers to salvation or to lead his congregation in godly living. Another commentator even went as far as to suggest that a man who felt called to become a pastor 
she'd put off going to Bible seminary until his children had all become Christians and were showing signs of real growth as disciples of Christ. We would have fewer casualties in the ministry if this policy were followed more often, he comments. The problem with that suggestion, however, is that it would lead men delaying their training quite possibly into their late 30s or early 40s or even beyond that. Other commentators point out that parents can really only be held responsible for their children's spiritual development while they are in the family home and are still minors. Once children leave the parental home, go to university or begin work, that responsibility ceases. If they go on to either reject the Christian faith or gradually drift away from it, that is not down to mum and dad. That is their own responsibility. It's not that as adults they've become wild and disobedient. They may be model citizens with responsible jobs and families of their own of whom they take good care. But they have turned their backs on their Christian heritage and the decision and thus the responsibility is theirs alone. Abraham Piper is the son of John Piper, the respected Bible teacher and author in America. Abraham Piper is now in his late 30s and has rejected the evangelical Christianity of his youth. He makes regular posts on social media critiquing it. He's built up a following for himself of over 900,000 subscribers who view his short videos berating the church culture he was raised in. I imagine it is very distressing for his father, John Piper, and his family. But his son is his own man. John Piper can't be held responsible for his son's actions. Now he is nearly 40. Therefore, this type of scenario would not mean John Piper or any man is disqualified from Christian leadership. What then are we to conclude about a man's fitness to serve as an elder in regard to his family life? Well, certainly his children should not be tearaways, troublemakers, terrorizing the local neighborhood. Instead, his children should know how to behave, should be disciplined and should be respectful. In their early years, perhaps up to their mid-teens at least, they should reflect the faith of their parents and be willing to sit under Christian instruction. These two instances would give credence to the belief that a man is managing his own household well and is fit to serve as an elder. What kind of leaders does the local church need? Well, it needs a team, not just a, a single elder, but a plurality of elders. It needs men. The biblical model for church leadership is male. It doesn't mean a, a church cannot employ a full-time women's worker, as many larger churches do, but the ruling body of the church, the eldership, is to be comprised of men. And those men are to be blameless, of good standing, to whom no mud sticks. They are to be the polar opposite of the men behaving badly culture portrayed in the 1990s sitcom juvenile men who never wanted to grow up or to take responsibility. That blamelessness is clearly evident in their home life. A candidate for eldership is a one woman man of whom there is no hint of sexual impropriety. He manages his household well. It's not that there aren't sometimes tensions and difficulties in the family home, but he and his wife handle them conscientiously. The children grow up to appreciate and their respect their, Christian, their parents' Christian faith, despite growing up in a world increasingly hostile to Christianity. These are the qualities a church should be looking for in the leaders it appoints. But they're not the only ones. And we will look at some more next week. Amen.